welcome to Brewing the Facts, a show where I delve into some interesting beer facts throughout history from medieval brewing to the time when soccer teams sponsored their own team's beer. Today I begin the process of creating a raspberry jalapeno wheat ale by seeping some delicious grains in what will be my own partial mash recipe. The beer is actually a part of a personal series of mine where I create a beer to try and match up with one of the classic Doctor Who incarnations. This beer will be called Zyton 7 as a representation of the Sixth Doctor played by Colin Baker. The Sixth Doctor can be sweet and spicy with his attitude, but he also has a darker side. So this beer will try to capture all of those attributes. The grains I am seeping are Simpson's Finest Maris Otter Malt from England, Weyermann's Munich One Malt from Germany, and a Brees Midnight Wheat Malt from the U.S using wheat from Wisconsin. The midnight wheat will add color but no bitter flavors. It starts sweet and has hints of a roasted flavor which should go well with the jalapenos that I will add to the secondary fermenter with the raspberry puree. The Caram Munich One Malt will add a sweet malty flavor and aroma and will also give an enhanced body and malt character. Marisada, of course, will be one of my base malts giving a nutty malty flavor. Uh, which should go well with this beer. Later I'll use a weed extract, but we could go over that later. I will be seeping the grains for 60 minutes at about 145 degrees to 150 degrees. You know, I do not take for granted how easy it was for me to get these grains, by the way. I knew what kind of flavors I wanted and I could go online and search for exactly what I wanted and just get it delivered right to my house. You could also go to the store and do the same thing. There'll be descriptions that tell you exactly how the malts were roasted. It tells you the love of bond, the color that it could be. But things were a lot different in the time of the Middle Ages. We might call a warm fermented beer an ale nowadays, but back in the Middle Ages, ale and beer were two different things. A beer used hops, which I will use in my recipe later, but an ale did not use hops and was more commonplace in England in the Middle Ages because hops weren't really plentiful. Therefore, the shelf life was very short and other ingredients would need to be added. Let's travel back in time to 13th century England. This is the time before hops came to the region and it was also a time that women, known as alewives, dominated the brewing industry. There were two types of ale at this time, weak ale, which was low in alcohol content and consumed at breakfast and on breaks during long work days, especially for laborers and farmers who worked long days. Not only did it give the workers and farmers energy, it also was part of their food source, as many of the weak ales were like liquid bread, a phrase that was used a lot during my college days to justify a breakfast beer. I'll have some eggs and uh, maybe some liquid toast. Then there was a strong ale, which was drank for dinner and at the end of the day and for celebrations. This ale was higher in alcohol, of course, and was usually aged in barrels. Strong ale was more of a drink for royalty as poorer people didn't have the special ingredients or storage. In order for a strong ale to ferment, cellars were needed to allow for the process to complete. While strong ale lasted longer because of a higher alcohol content, weak ale had a very short shelf life and would be made constantly and consumed right away. This is known because of a book written by Judith Bennett, Ale, Beer, and Brewsters in England, Women's Work in a Changing World, 1300 to 1600. This book was published in 1996 and explored the transition from women dominating the brewing industry to men slowly taking over during this period. In Bennett's research, we learn a recipe and process for a weak and strong ale from that time period based on written accounts of two different households. Today, almost all of our beers would be considered strong ales. As for a weak ale, have you ever had a non-alcoholic beer? That would be pretty close, as weak ales were never over 3% alcohol and were most likely in the 1 to 1.5% range. Alewives, of course, slowly were ousted from the brewing industry after shady practices by men to get rid of the competition, which included accusing women of being witches sometimes. Brewers in the Middle Ages used oats, barley, rye, or spelt, which is a type of hulled wheat. And while we have so many choices of grain to make the style we choose, anyone making beer back then would just brew with what either grew in their area or what was sold in their area. 
the next time you are overwhelmed by what beer to choose at a brewery, what clothes to wear, or what to watch on a streaming site, think about how crazy it would be if you didn't have any choices to make. But the lack of choice didn't matter to people in the Middle Ages. They just needed to get some nutrition and a little energy for a day of hard work. And while it was a myth that people drank beer over water because of pollution, some people just preferred it, especially with the cheap cost of making simple ale. Imagine plowing a field all day but not having much food being a poor peasant. What you did have was some weak ale. Drink a bowl and go about your day. I could try that now, but I don't think I would make it past the stadium gates with a bowl of ale in my hands. While I am making a beer with the intention of later adding raspberry puree and jalapenos, there were some other types of concoctions back in the Middle Ages. The German purity law, known as Reinheitsgebot, wasn't introduced until 1516. The law stated that only barley hops and water, and later yeast once it was officially discovered, should be in beer. But ale was different in the centuries before the purity law. The regions, such as Burton-on-Trent, contained hard water, for example. But there were some specialty brews that added ingredients despite hops not being around. Groot, or an ale that used an herb mixture including rosemary, fennel, thyme, rose hips, yarrow, parsley, sage, hyssop, savory, chamomile, or mint. These beers were mostly in Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands at this time. Posit Ale was an ale mixed with hot milk, mostly for poorer people. Braggot was an ale brewed with honey and spices, mostly for noblemen and royalty because spices like cinnamon, clove, nutmeg, and ginger were expensive. And leafy herbs or fruit would also help create wild yeast to ferment the wort. This was with people not understanding the process of fermentation and that yeast was a very necessary ingredient. They did know that something was happening though, and some brewers even scraped off some of the croissant that forms on the top of the beer in the primary vessel or from the sediment at the bottom to make bread or to use on future ales. This process of cultivating yeast is much more advanced today, but it was smart of the alewives to realize the Krausen was important and that it could be used multiple times to allow for more ale and bread to be made for the household. Back in the Middle Ages, flavors came from the region depending on the water they used uh, and, and the grains that they were able to get and then the wild yeasts from that area. That's why a lot of styles from regions, that's where we get that term. Uh, but there were some other ingredients that were used to add some flavor. You know, while grains nowadays are roasted to add bitterness and color to an ale, back then kilns were used to dry grain and to roast them on a fire of wood for a very short period of time. Since most beers were only fermented for short periods of time, the sweet smoky flavor would be strong. English ales were especially sweet with a lack of hops, though they did use other things to add bitterness. Anyone who has tasted wort before fermenting would comment on how sweet the flavor is, so one would assume that the weak ales of old were sweet as well. Early ales were not boiled, however. So while the ale had sweet flavors, it wasn't as sweet as one would expect. You need to account for the smokiness of the grains and for the lack of scientific knowledge of how to extract the proteins and sugar. Throw in the wild yeast and beers would have elements to mask any sweetness, much like sourdough bread. Hops also add bitterness. So without hops, to offset some of the sweet flavors of ale in the Middle Ages, people would use things like juniper, wormwood, tansy, or mugwort. Today, those ingredients are still used to make specialty brews, and there are even some homebrewing recipes out there as well. But by the 1500s, hops did come into the region of England and everything changed. More beer could be made and stored with the preservative. More beer could be consumed. By the 1600s, breweries were all over England and people were drinking about three quarters of a liter every day, according to Central European University professor Richard W. Unger in an article written on the university website. And yes, that is a lot of beer. Right now I'm doing a sparging hack that I came up with. I'm done seeping the grain and now I am slowly adding some hot water. What this does is rinse off any excess simple sugars to give me the best wort possible until I add the yeast. It isn't something most home brewers do unless they're making an all grain batch, but I have really noticed a difference. The purpose to seep grains, of course, is to allow enzymes to convert starches to simple sugars. Those simple sugars are what the yeast eats uh, to create two byproducts, alcohol and CO2. And while we can make extract beers, all grain beers, or partial mashes like mine, techniques were much different in the Elizabethan era. 
Between the years of 1558 and 1603, Queen Elizabeth I ruled England during the Tudor period, but her reign was also known as the Elizabethan era. While Queen Elizabeth was busy putting lead makeup on her face, winning wars against the Spanish Armada, imprisoning and beheading Mary, Queen of the Scots, and forcing people to paint false images of her without rotting teeth, poor peasants were still brewing beer to handle the poverty-stricken, classist society they lived in. Barley, wheat, and oats were the main grains of this time period, and all of it would be malted. People soaked the grain in water, allowed it to sprout for a few days, and then would dry it in an oven before storage. Kilning back then was much different than today, though. Grain was placed on a straw mat or other false floor, and a wood fire was built to bake the grain. The grain was baked for several hours and was stirred in turn to prevent a burnt mess. Today, this process is done with a water spray to control temperature and to produce grains at all different degrees of roasting. That is why we have the color and flavor profiles we do today. Most beers were dark in Elizabethan times as grains were usually kilned for the same amount of time. The water was also hard in the English region, so darker ales like porters were more present. Next comes the mashing. While brewers at this time didn't know that enzymes in the grain broke down starches into fermentable sugars, they weren't dumb. Trial and error, much like home brewers, was the key process of finding out the correct times and temperatures to get the best result. Sparging is the most common technique today of creating a mash when the sugars are rinsed from the grain into the wort. We first seep the grains like tea in warm water and then use sparging to finish the job. In Elizabethan times, the double and triple mashing technique was used. Hot water was mixed with the grains, and then the batch was drained after sitting for a good period of time. This was done multiple times until it was ready to boil the wort with hops, as this is about 200 to 300 years after the original ales of the early medieval period we mentioned before. People probably were poisoned at this time and didn't even know it, as lead pots were used by some poorer people. Copper vessels were used as well. Both types of pots are dangerous, which is why we use stainless steel today. Some copper pots have a stainless steel lining. That wasn't the case back then. The wort would then be cooled in a barrel for a few days, and the wort would also attract wild yeasts that would later ferment the brew. And that allowed people to drink away the sorrows of living in a time with horrible medicine, short lifespans, and an oppressive regime. At least some of those things has changed in the present times. It is amazing to think how the brewing industry has changed over the years. One, the cost has obviously changed. I'm making a beer today that would probably only be made for royalty. And it is at my fingertips, very cheap. This beer will cost about $1.50 a bottle to make and is one of the more expensive beers I've made because of the addition of a fruit mash. So I cheers those brewers in the Middle Ages for somehow making what they did work without even understanding all the concepts and the science and technology that is used in both modern techniques and equipment to give us beer lovers all of the styles and tastes we love. This has been Brewing the Facts. Join me next week when I continue this partial mash recipe and talk about some old breweries.